Hello everyone and welcome to Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. As you may already know, my name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and as always, I will be the man with the questions. Today, I'm very privileged to have Kevin Warwick as my guest with the answers. Kevin is a professor of cybernetics at the University of Reading, England, where he carries out research in artificial intelligence, robotics, and cyborgs. Kevin is best known, however, for his pioneering experiments involving, involving a neurosurgical implantation into the median nerves of his left arm to link his nervous system directly to a computer and also with the first purely electronic direct communication between the nervous systems of two humans. So, hi Kevin, and welcome to Singularity One-on-One. -on -One. Hi Nicola, good to be back, good to speak with you again. Excellent, Kevin. Uh, it's been seven or eight months since our last conversation, and I have to say that uh, during that time, our podcast uh, has uh, come to top two of, of my podcasts. Uh, you, mean it's not, you mean it's not number one? It, this is terrible. It's not number one just yet, and that's among one of the reasons that I invited you back here, because uh, number one was the one with Aubrey de Grey, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and I yeah. thought that uh, yours was at least as good and perhaps a little more funny, too. So uh, this is our chance to do better. <laughs> well, I, I, it, you, you didn't need to do Aubrey's just yet because he's going to live forever anyway. So you could have waited a couple of hundred years and... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. He's a great guy and um, a little bit crazy, but but really good fun. Yeah. Well, but aren't we all crazy? I mean, uh, th I that's so. that's very much <laughs> said about yourself too. Yeah. Well, I hope so. I, I think um, when you're pushing, whether it's in a philosophical sense or a, a scientific technical sense, if you're pushing the boundaries and raising questions, then either people say you're um, you're crazy because they perhaps don't understand some of the points, um, or they say you're a visionary, you, you're seeing ahead. So uh, I, I guess they mean the same thing in that sense. And I mean, this has been set for pretty much all pioneers in all fields. I mean, Captain Scott, Scott Captain Cook, uh, Einstein, you name it. Most of those famous geniuses were called crazies too at the same time. And, and, and there's even, I think, quite a lot uh, of Amazon forests destroyed uh, in investigating the links between craziness and genius. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think in... Um particularly in the fictional world, but it, it's true with, let's say, a lot of the pioneering experiments in medicine, when they've succeeded, the person can be regarded as, yeah, a visionary, somebody ahead of their time, fantastic, and so on. But when they go wrong and the person maybe dies from it, as you said, a Captain Scott, died, then it gets questioned, they're, they're, what an idiot, how could they make <laughs> such a stupid decision? Um, so it's a very, very thin line. You, you, as a scientist, you make a hypothesis and then you try and prove it right. Um, and you, you do that every day with experiments sometimes you get it right sometimes wrong often it's just small points but um, if it, for the big points when it involves your life maybe then of course uh, you, you really put yourself on the line absolutely and I think that's why they say as you just put it you know if you succeed you're a genius if you fail yeah. you're a crazy and uh, in terms of money people put it like if you're rich and you're crazy you're just eccentric Right. Yes. If you're, yes, if yes. you're poor, <laughs> then yep, you're just yep. simply crazy. Oh yes. Oh, <laughs> so yes. the same. Yeah, yeah. The same. Yep. Um, anyway, let's move on to something more substantial here, and let me start our proper interview here with the first question, um, which would be this: Is there any um, new development uh, or discovery since our last conversation that um, has shown some promise of us? Uh, reaching those goals and those milestones that we discussed last time about, say, for example, connecting the human brain to a machine and so on? Well, I, um, I, I will sort of slightly rephrase the last bit of your question because um, 
we're at the time now in England, students doing projects. They, they usually start the projects in October time, and then about this time up to Easter, they, it, it comes to fruition. And now what I get at, at Reading, perhaps because of the work I do, quite a few students who want to do projects to do with implants. Mm -hmm. um, now, Clearly, it's impossible to start putting implants into the brains or nervous systems of students as part of their degree program. It's, it's you know, getting ethical approval for that, we wouldn't even consider it. However, what we've been doing, and this, this is um, sort of piggybacking on what a guy called Todd Huffman has been doing down in Arizona, um, you, using mag magnets implanted into fingertips. Mm -hmm. Now, hopefully you'll be able to put some pictures on with yep. this to show exactly that. Um, and what they'll show is Jawesh, who's the, the first of the students, he's had two... Um, magnets, very small magnets, implanted in fingertips of his left hand, and you see uh, in one picture uh, x-rays of the magnets in his fingertips. What we do is put small coils of wire around the finger with, with the magnet in place, mm -hmm. and then link the the coil of wire up to a current source that that changes now the current source then changes dependent on another sensory input and in the images you see Jawish wearing ultrasonic so sonar sensors on a baseball cap which are connected to the coil of wire so as an object comes closer to the sonar sensors the magnet is vibrated more and more the closer the object comes. So the, the person, in this case the student, can feel how far objects are away from them, pretty accurately really. Uh, and it, it's interesting, I mean it's interesting from a research point of view, it opens up possibilities clearly for, for blind people to literally to point at objects and get a, a pretty good accurate indication of how far they are away. I um, have another student now who is looking to connect up to an infrared source. So in this case, he'll be able to point at an object and feel how hot it is, which is quite interesting, uh, which obviously has applications potentially for, for the military domain. If you're a soldier and you're about to go into a room and you don't know if there's anybody in there, Okay, with this magnet implanted, you could just push your finger around the corner and just sort of scan the room, I guess, and detail, oh, yeah, there's, there's somebody there or there's somebody over there, and then go in the room, you'd know where people were before you went in. So there, there's interesting applications of that. Um, but I, for me, I'm, I'm thinking now that because the students are having some good fun with these magnet implants, it's um, uh, quite, quite a fun, they, they work very well. How exactly do you gauge the distance, I wonder, <laughs> when you're, say, three feet or eight feet away, how do you figure that out based on the vibration input that you've mentioned? Yeah, it, it is dependent on the sensor you use largely as to the resolution of it. But it is, it appears with the students, you get quite a fine resolution, particularly you can say, oh, it's a long distance away or it's not so far away or it's close by. You know, that resolution is quite easy, but we're looking to really um, get small changes in the distance away. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you're thinking that is 2.15 meters away. You're, you're mm -hmm. not getting a mathematical disc. It's, it's more of a, it is a, a, a different sense in that, uh, you know, in that sense that you're getting more a feeling that it's coming closer to you or moving further away. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely that there's something there or not. Uh, so it is converting a touch sense into something different. But the, the magnets are not particularly expensive because of early work that people like Todd have done before. Um, the, now the, the covering on them is pretty robust, so when they're implanted, Jawesh, his implants have now been in for quite some time. There's no um, adverse reaction as far as the body's concerned. They, they seem pretty reliable. They're fairly easy to stimulate the, the sensory feelings 
doesn't seem to wear off after a period of time. It changes a little, but you still have the feelings there. Mm -hmm. And it's quite a nice, from an academic point of view, it's quite a nice research angle. It's th They've really been used a lot in the body modification area. So yeah. they've not got a strong academic track record. There's not a lot of papers, which is quite fun, really, because you, you don't have to follow certain traditional lines. You don't have to do the research like that. You don't have to do this experiment. It, it's a fairly open playing field. So I, I hope others get involved. Um, uh, the, the one problem we have, that in the UK, the guy who mainly implants these things, he's a tattoo artist up in Manchester who goes by the name of Dr. Evil. Now, he's a, he's a nice, really nice guy, but when it comes, we still have to get ethical approval from the university health, you know, the university committee, the ethics committee, the research committee, and so on. And when they see these forms saying that Dr. Evil is he's going implanting. to perform, he's <laughs> implanting the students, they immediately, oh dear, 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 which is understandable. So we have to do all sorts of explanations that he does actually actually have, you know, a track record and he's not such a bad guy after all and maybe it's a bit of a stage name but it's, it's difficult to get these more crusty academics who are there really to uh, make sure everything is above board, that, uh, which, is, which is proper I guess, but um, to sort of matching that up with Dr. Evil is not so easy. <laughs> that's, that's very interesting Kevin. Um, and. I also want to find out how far you have progressed on your little rat brains, uh, rat brained, uh, robots. But before that, let me just ask you, do you have any other additional new projects that you would like to share with us? Well, well, I do. Um, you were talking about me being crazy. Uh, I've got a student this year, Ashley, his name is. There should be a, an image people can see as well of Ashley and what he has, has put together. Now, this is based, there was a, a really good researcher a few years ago who unfortunately died called Paul Backy Rita. Some people might know the name. What he was into was sensory substitution. So not too far different to what we've been talking about with magnets, but in particular, Paul looked at stimulating the tongue, using the tongue as a communication device that you can communicate through the tongue. And this is actually, this is what he's doing. So what he's built is a, a little unit with a number of electrodes on it that you, you see in the image. And what he does is apply different current pulses in, into certain of the electrodes so that he can detect shapes and messages as different pulses are put in, so literally to communicate. Um, now, uh, so the research he's doing, as is part of his degree program, he's actually built this unit and now he's trying to see how quickly he can learn to recognize pulses and the sort of resolution and can he recognize letter shapes and all sorts of things. So literally you can sort of write into his mouth, but testing the, the more the taste buds, more to the front mm -hmm. of the tongue and the texture uh, and comparing the ones at the, 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 the nerve endings on the back of his tongue and seeing which one works better and all that sort of thing. So there's a lot of research involved to see what sort of signals where, how quickly you can send more signals in. But one of the, the funniest things was just before Christmas he came to me, he got the unit all built up and he said, well, I'm, I'm not sure, should I use milliamps or microamps? <laughs> and uh, I, mean, I said to him, well, probably it's best if you start with microamps with the mic and then if, if, it, if it doesn't do to, you know, increase, do it that way. Well, he came to me the next day and he said, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he had actually used, got the circuit not quite right and used milliamp straight away and almost, you know, electrocuted his tongue, which was about three times bigger than it should have been. <laughs> but fortunately, another day or so later, he was um, 
back to normal again. Um, <laughs> but he, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic what he's doing. I mean, he's, he's just an undergraduate student and he's very much driven this along himself um, and had a lot of the ideas himself. And I, I don't have to push him, which is fantastic. Project meetings involve him saying, now, what I'm doing now is, and he reels off a whole string of experiments that he's doing. He doesn't seem to sleep or anything. He's just doing this testing. And it, it really is research work you know we're, we're already writing a an academic paper for a journal on what he's doing which is absolutely fantastic he's just doing his, his bachelor's degree wow. which which for me is absolutely amazing so but it's great to be able to work working with these sort of people means that I you know I, I tag my name on the end of a paper when really somebody like this has done all the work and everything and I, I just change a few of the letters in the paper and I'm associated with it in some way so it's, it's absolutely I really enjoy it you know some people say they get older and they get bored with the job and oh I, I, I hope Aubrey is right and we live till we're about 600 or more because if there's students like this around then I, I can't wait for next year's crowd you know life's a, life's a whiz you know it's fantastic so depending from the point of view you're surrounding yourself either with pioneers or with crazies um, <laughs> as, as we said before, the, the gap is that uh, they're both. They're both. I mean, uh, people uh, willing to put their tongues on the line. <laughs> <laughs> he, he certainly does. I mean, I never know from week to week, you know, whether he opens his mouth, whether he's going to be able to talk, or whether he'll come out with, <laughs> whether he's put amps into his tongue instead, and now it's, he's, he's blown himself up or something like that. So, well, during our last interview, your major message was you have to take risks to be part of the future. So I guess both you and your students <laughs> are... <laughs> I, I, yeah, no, I mean, that is true. Um, and science can be so much fun. And some people say, oh, it's boring because they're use, looking at equations and things like that. And it looks, uh, science, it's, it's great. It, you know, it's really good. And you, you, when you're doing things like, we, these are undergraduates, but we're, we're finding out things that we don't know. I mean, we, Generally, society doesn't know. You know, can you communicate by a tongue? Can you feel body heat over a distance in your finger when you point at something? I mean, it's great to have the opportunity to, to try these things out and that students want to try them out is absolutely brilliant. I mean, it really makes life... You, I, I get up in the morning and I can't wait to get into the place here and get, see what's going on. It, it's, it's wonderful. Fantastic. Uh, I'm just wondering, because I remember maybe at some point last year I published uh, a video of the BBC uh, showing some research about uh, blind people uh, trying to see with their tongue, too. So I wonder if yeah. your undergraduate student has any connection to that research, or is, it, is he following it, or... No, no, I mean, it, this is something different. I mean, to be honest, that one links very closely with the, perhaps more with the, the magnet implants, because what, what, what's happening there is people, if I understand right, is, is making a, a clicking type thing with their tongue to get some echoes back from that because their hearing is quite acute and they can get a sort of a, well, an ultrasonic sense, an echo location, a, a bit like a dolphin does. Or a bat. Or a bat, or yeah, a bat, it's yeah. exactly that. Yeah, what it does show is that humans, I mean, in that case, the, the blind people that are skillful in making the noise, humans can, uh, their brains can adapt to understand that the, the clicking and how quickly it comes back indicates distance. Mm -hmm. So you're converting something into a, a sense of distance. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing with the, with the magnets and the ultrasonics, as you, you see, but with a bit of technology thrown in. But it really is changing a, a, a feeling sense into a distant sense. What you feel depends directly on how far an object is away. And it, I mean, it does show our brains are very plastic, very adaptive, uh, all sorts Amazing. of things we could do. Um, I mean, and I, as you're saying, amazing. I, I think the, the clicking for the blind people is is amazing itself. But how much more could we do? We 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 really are restricted in how we are as humans, and could extend all sorts of abilities. We can push our brains. Mm -hmm. 
So let me put our conversation a little bit in more personal terms here. Um, last time we spoke, you threw a very friendly challenge to Ray Kurzweil by saying something like, why hasn't Ray experimented yet with implants? Yes. Right? Well, let me ask you this. It's been eight or nine years, I think it was in 2002, uh, when you last uh, experimented directly with implants. Now yes. you have all kinds of interesting things happening around you with your students, but how about yourself? Are you willing to watch others have all the fun, or are you willing to... <laughs> <laughs> the, the simple answer is no. Um, I have to say at the moment, the, the students with magnets are having a lot of fun, and they're getting some good results. And uh, it's not a particularly invasive procedure, even if it is Dr. Evil, um, which, again, is a bit of fun, but... Uh, I, I really do fancy having a go for that. So I, I may well this summer um, follow the line of the students and, uh, you know, uh, for, a, for a year or two try that one. Um, mm. I suspect a lot of other people will because we, we're getting some very, very good results and I'm quite jealous when the students say, yes, I feel that's closer or, oh, no, that's not so good. And, and we're looking to try again with with several students to to try and link their senses together to to communicate sort of finger to finger literally one sending a signal and then the other sends it back again what what is that thing on that i can't remember where you get the fingers joining together but uh, to communicate in terms of a touch sense li literally a telegraphic mm -hmm. system to communicate finger to finger and I, I would love to experience that and the only way i'm going to experience is it if i get a a magnet implanted so i'll, I'll definitely go for that I think um, probably this this summer as for the neural implant which is the big one it's still very much on the cards um, but we, we still have a bit more to do with it so I'm uh, finding the exact position and so on I'm still not quite ready for that and I'm still quite young um, I, I've just turned <laughs> <laughs> just, you mean that I've, if you get it wrong it's not going to be a swollen tongue the, well, that's the problem with it, yeah. No, seriously. Um, I mean, I, I put 60 as the sort of age. I'm now, I may look 21, but I'm actually 57, which means it, it's still about three years away. And I, I put that as the age because, yes, if you get it wrong, um, I mean, it's serious times. And uh, But I, having lived 60 years, then, okay, it's been a good time anyway. So... But I, I don't want to not do it, if you see what I mean. So it's sort of minimizing the risk um, uh, more than anything else by being older, if you see the logic in that. I, I see the logic. I just, I just suggest that you might want to wait even a little longer because imagine if Aubrey and Ray are right in their predictions that we might be able to live to a thousand years, then the 60 uh, cutoff it's point nothing. would not it's make nothing. sense. No, I mean, it is still a baby, really, isn't it? Yeah, and you're, absolutely. You're, you're just, just embarking on life. It's just the start. I really hope they are right, yeah. yeah. So do I. <laughs> uh, but it, it is amazing, though. I mean, the, all, some of Aubrey's statistics are incredible, and the, the whole concept at the moment that every 10 years the average life expectancy increases by two years, mm -hmm. which which means that every 10 minutes you live, you've only actually wa used up eight minutes. Eight, yeah. as it were. You, you've sort of gained two, you've, you've got two minutes free, mm -hmm. as it were, which is incredible. And you that's accelerating too. Yeah, is it getting more and more? Absolutely, Brilliant. yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, if we manage to get 10 minutes and you, the life expectancy, in, sorry, 10 years life expectancy increases by 11 years, then we're all living forever. Yeah. So. Yeah. And actually, but just because I, I actually spoke with him yesterday again for my second interview and uh, his uh, estimate was a thousand rather than 600. And the reason for that was because he said that at the current rate of uh, other accidental deaths, say when uh, being run from a truck or something like that, when you're 
outside biking on your bicycle. Or, or electrocuting your tongue. <laughs> yeah, yeah e even if you're healthy enough, uh, there could be other factors which could, you know, sort of take you down. But, yes. of course, that assumes that, that that rate would not change in the future, which is not a very reasonable assumption because perhaps as we improve uh, traffic safety and regulations yeah. and stuff, those deaths would also decrease, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, one, one question, I don't know whether you asked, Aubrey, but because life expectancy, I mean, it's great from an individual perspective, but it does change social issues. Yeah. I mean, al already I, I feel that as we're living longer, so the standard form of a, a lifetime marriage to another person mm -hmm. um, is is sort of get, it, it's not the, not the normal concept now. I, I, where, whereas you were married for thirty or forty years and that was it, that was your and you died. Now you're married for thirty or forty years, you've still got quite a long life to go and I, I think there are many many more divorces now people change so it might be we we just have to accept if you're going to live to your 600 that you are maybe married for 20 years and then you move on we you just you know okay that's it bye bye or you get an opt-out clause you, you or you have just... to renew your vows every 50 or 100 years <laughs> <laughs> something like that yeah. uh, so, you know, it, things like that relationships and agreements that that have been sort of more lifelong uh, lifelong agreements um i think we when life is a different length 600 a thousand Absolutely. Years, yeah. Probably need to question all those sort of things, really. But I'm not sure what Audrey, Aub Aubrey thinks about that. But anyway, there we go. That, that was that's another day. <laughs> uh, okay, let me uh, see. Um, let's go back to your uh, rat-brained uh, yes. robot. Um, yes. Last time I spoke to you, I think uh, you were planning to move on to using human uh, neuron cells rather than rat brain cells. Has yeah, that been I, uh, accomplished yet? I'm, a, I'm afraid not. We we have the human neurons. They're, they're there waiting. We actually have them frozen, waiting to go. We're ready to defrost them any time. We, since we talked, we've had a couple of issues. One, because we moved buildings. We had this quaint old building, which was absolutely wonderful, and we have everything working perfectly. And the university said, oh, this is all fantastic. Have a nice new building. So the whole unit moved across into the new building, which, just as an aside, is called the Harry Hopkins building. Harry Hopkins is the guy, about the most famous person previously in the University of Reading years gone by. He um, invented, if you like, or developed the fiber optic endoscope which is you. So this is the note of fame for the university. He now has a building named after him. That's all the positive. The negative is that in that building where we're culturing the, uh, the rat brain, robot, um, there is an enormous virus that it is, it has been difficult to nail down exactly what it is. So our cultures have been living for about two weeks or so and then dying off. I, I think we've nailed it down. Um, we really don't know what so it's a problem with biological brains like this. You get some virus creeping in and it, it, you, you have to try and eradicate it somehow, but it's difficult to know what it is, where it's coming from and mm -hmm. so on. But because of these new facilities, we've had this problem. Um, I think we've sorted it, um, but we didn't want to start using the human neurons because they're, they're a lot more delicate anyway. Uh, and if, if the rat neurons couldn't survive, then these, the human neurons probably wouldn't anyway. So I think, so we, it's just unfortunately one of those things. The other thing is as well, we, we're now at the stage, um, sort of bridging across from one grant to another and trying to pull a bit more money in for extra researchers and so on. So the two things have combined to delay actually put in human neurons in the robot body. So apologies about that. Watch this space, I think. Uh, for me, it's been, you know, it's not been a bad time because it's been replaced by students electrocuting their tongues and putting <laughs> magnets in their fingers. So I've had plenty to keep me going, but, uh, <laughs> but it's been, I, I'm eager to get going. With and it, that's yeah. another excuse for me to get you again in another yeah. year or so just to, to keep updated it. on your work. 
it's, it's, it's difficult enough for me to keep updated on my work, I have to say, with the, the students coming in at the moment. But, but this one hopefully will be kick-started again before too long. So, Fantastic. But uh, there, there's some other exciting stuff I have, have to say. Hopefully we'll be able to say next time round. Um, whether it's commercially sensitive, I don't know, but I'll see what I can tell people as long as, as, long as everybody doesn't tell anybody else. Really. <laughs> All right. Okay. Excellent. Um, I recently, let me ask you this, I, I recently watched uh, the preview trailer for a documentary movie about Alan Turing. Oh, and, yeah. And, uh, what an excellent trailer that is, yes. <laughs> you have a very prominent space there uh, for, uh, I don't know, however long time in the trailer. You say that, in your opinion, Turing is number one uh, in terms of genius, even greater than Einstein and Newton. Why yeah. do you think that's yeah. the case? Oh, I, I mean, what myself and, and a number of the computers are an integral part of life. Um, his predictions, uh, what he was able to do and in, in terms of philosophy as well, back in 1950, were absolutely incredible. His, his views on what he conceived as the Turing test, when he did, with the technology that was available at that time, is, is mind-blowing. I mean, he, he was years ahead of the technology appearing. And even now, when you look at what he said in the Turing test, there are still professors of computer science that do not understand what Turing was talking about. And he, he had to talk in terms of... To, because people didn't know what computers were in the 1950s. In that sense, I mean, computers used to be people that were doing repetitive computation. Compu yeah, what we call computational things, and to use to use the name in terms of describing a piece of technology in itself was a progressive step. But a lot of people then didn't know that, so he he came up with initial ideas, sort of parables, really, and say, let's compare a man and a woman, and you you can't see them, and you communicate, and you have to decide which one's which. And now we will replace the woman with a computer, and now you have to do the same. Uh, which Describing what the Turing test was as a parable in order that people could understand what he was talking about. And now you get people going off, oh no, we've got to have a woman, and we've got... Oh my God, he was talking 60, 70 years, 60 years ago, and even now people don't understand exactly what he was talking about, simply because he had to describe it in stories at the time, because people, do, well, there we go. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very much appreciative of more practical, experimental people, and um, somebody, Einstein, I think, was, I mean, obviously a, a very clever guy, and uh, the equations that he came up with transformed our understanding of the world and physics as it was and so on. But I'm, I'm not so myself appreciative of more theoretical people, I have to say. Um, but somebody like Michael Faraday appeals to me more because of the experimental work they did and, and things like that. So I'm more, and what Turing did with the Enigma code, um, and then what he subsequently did in terms of assessing what computers can do and his philosophy, for me, yeah, he was a genius. And the more I find out about and understand myself about what he wrote and what he said, the more I feel that way. Yeah, and the other thing is that Einstein did have to, the opportunity to enjoy uh, his life for a very long time and the reputation that he built and everything, whereas with Turing it's a tragedy that oh, he terrible, terrible. finished his life at, I think, 42, and it was a suicide, and he was totally... Uh, he lost his reputation, he lost his security clearance. Uh, right. It was just, I mean, basically we pushed him into a suicide, I think. It was Ab horrible. Absolutely tragedy. amazing. I mean, because of his homosexuality, yeah. that's how he was. Um, yes, I, 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 yeah, Einstein was perhaps not... I mean, he, he received plaudits. He obviously won the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. I mean, he also had his enemies. 
uh, in the scientific community, particularly the academic community, but I guess that goes with the territory. If you're, you know, if you're that sort of person, you're going to have people that disagree strongly. I mean, I, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying he was a terrible guy or anything like that, but he is by many people regarded as one of, the, if not the top scientist in the last 100, 200 years. Well, he's okay, yes. But the, uh, Turing, I personally regard a lot more highly because of what he did and uh, his um, almost, not, not premonitions, but uh, the very accurate predictions uh, as to the possibilities with computers as where they would go and what they would turn out. The, the one area he, as far as computers are concerned, that he didn't quite... Um, Put, put his nail into, as it were, was the concept of networking. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess that be, would be very, very difficult to, to feel that, that, you know, back in 1950 as to the possibilities and what effect networking would have. But in terms of the way machines think, just that concept that machines can think, and how do we test it and what it means, and then relating that to how humans, if you... You're trying to test a human as to how they're thinking and so on. How do you do that? And all his work really relates very, very closely to that. I mean, absolutely phenomenal. So, yeah, I, f I firmly believe what I said. I, I agree with you entirely. I think he was treated despicably, um, not just by the scientific community, but by um, politicians and the world around. It's a great shame what happened to him. Absolutely. Uh, I wish Aubrey had been there then and could have given Alan a few tips as to how to live a lot longer. It's interesting, my um, Alan Turing used to be part of uh, a, a sort of a, a dining club in London um, and they, they used to meet up you know, once every two or three weeks, called the Ratio Club, R-A-T-I-O. Now, th th and there's a nice picture, people, if, if you Google on Ratio Club, you'll see this picture. Um, and I think at the moment, there, there a lot of people in the picture, of course, they've died, because this is a picture from 1950, but there's still a couple of people. One is a guy, Horace Barlow, who is alive and still associated with the University of Cambridge. Uh, in the picture, and he's still alive now. And the other is a guy called John Westcott, who is still alive, um, and he was my PhD supervisor. So I have a, <laughs> I have this sort of, you know, the link. Direct and intellectual link. Di direct link with uh, yeah. with Alan Turing <laughs> via this dining club. Strange, strange things happen like That's that. That's fascinating. You know, one of the other reasons why I brought the name of Alan Turing today, besides the documentary coming up for his life, is uh, the fact that he was the first person to predict that eventually uh, machines would defeat us in chess and yeah. many other things. And, of course, uh, we know that in the last three days, uh, Watson has successfully defeated the best ever players in Jeopardy. Uh, so, uh, how do you see that? Do you see that as a sort of a milestone of an event in terms of accomplishing artificial intelligence? Or is it correct to say that, uh, I think as Noam Chomsky once said, I think, um, um, computer beating a, a human in chess or in jeopardy is as interesting to him as a bulldozer winning the weightlifting championship or, or uh, winning the gold medal on the Olympics in, in weightlifting. Yeah, you see, I, I, I'm, I mean, you put me on the spot now because I have to disagree with Noam Chomsky and really, I... I think it's not right for us as humans to belittle or not, I don't know, make, make fun of is not the right word. You know, other creatures to start with, you know, if, if we look at a cow or a monkey and, and say, oh, it, it's stupid, it doesn't be, simply because it's not doing things the, the, exactly the way we humans do it. You know, it doesn't understand or be, because it's not doing it exactly the same way. And when we're looking at machines, computers, we really have to be careful as to what we're saying. 
And the, what Chomsky says there, I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't regard that very highly at all. I mean, I, I mean, he's a very clever person, but not in this instance. Um, and I, I'm afraid I upset quite a few philosophers in, in, in saying that, perhaps. Um, but mach- just like other creatures, they, they probably understand, a cow may well understand things around them in their way, just like humans understand things our way. And a machine probably understands things it way, its way. And just because it's not exactly the same way as us, then you know, that, that is doing it its way. I mean, if, if I played you, Nicola, at chess, it doesn't matter who wins. I mean, it would probably be you. I'm not that good. But if you won, and then I said, oh, no, well, it doesn't count. You didn't win because you were thinking about eating chocolate at the time. You, you'd say, hey, hold on. No, I won. Chess was the game. That was the game, and it doesn't matter what, if I was thinking about chocolate or sex or, or watching the television, it doesn't matter what I was thinking about, chess was what we were playing. And that's the point here, it really, if chess is the game, or jeopardy, or a military uh, um, battle, whatever it is, if that's what's Directing air if that's flights, what the table, uh, directing air flights, doesn't matter what it is. Artillery fire or and if, if the machine encryption. or the cow or the the snail, whatever it is, does better than the human, then it's done better than the human. If it wins, it wins. If it was thinking about something completely different at the time, or if it was thinking in a different way to the human at the time, that is of no relevance or consequence whatsoever. So to say about the bulldozer, if the bulldozer wins and if the, the competition is to do with weightlifting, then the bulldozer's won. If the bulldozer was thinking about something very different at the time and thinking about having sex with other bulldozers or whatever it is bulldozers think of, fine. That's, that's of no consequence at all. But one shouldn't belittle bulldozers, cows, computers, because they do it in a different way. If, if this is the competition, that's the competition. And it's the same when it comes to playing football. If we had humans playing robots and in the future and the robots win, the robots win. We can say, oh, no, they, they, they didn't win really because they were thinking about electric sheep or something like that. No, well, it, it, it's of no consequence whatsoever. Or if we have a military campaign... Um, and uh, one team completely obliterates the other one, oh, well, it doesn't count because you were thinking about something else at the time. You can imagine with the, the Aztecs saying, no, the Spanish didn't defeat us because they were thinking about wine and women and gold, whereas we were thinking about schooling and transport or whatever it was. I mean, what the Spanish defeated the Aztec. That, that's what happened. And Red Indians were put on reservation. They can say, well, no, you didn't put us on reservations because you were think, thinking about something, reading newspapers when you were doing it. It's, it's absolutely ludicrous. So in this case, I disagree with Noam Chomsky. So in that sense, you, you'll agree with me that it is, in fact, a, a, a huge milestone very much so, very much so. And, and yes, it's a, it, there are lots of milestones. Um, the Turing test, which I think, it, it's not such an easy one to say a machine has passed it. But it might the, be the next one on the road, I oh, think. I mean, chess was first, now yeah. we're looking at Jeopardy, and, and maybe in another 10 or so years, maybe 15, even if it's 20, I think that's the next thing that I can see on, on the road. I don't think it'll be that long away. I, I mean, oh, you think it's, it's even faster? Than I that. think it's even sooner. It's a case wow. of doing it. I mean, we don't really get that many competitions where the Turing test can be passed because you need Turing. The way he stipulated it is a bit awkward, I have to say. I mean, I think he was careful with his words. But you, he used words and said, like, the average interrogator yeah. being fooled so many percent of the time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Which and is arbitrary, of course. Because it's a bit it's, arbitrary. Is 30 percent sufficient? Do we need yeah, like, more right. than 50 or 60? Yeah. Or do Got we it. need two-thirds? Like, 
and even the average interrogator, yeah. what the hell does that mean? Uh, you know, do we need a thousand people? Well, actually getting a thousand people to try it out who are average because you would need, as well as a professor of computer science, yeah. as uh, you would need a road sweeper, you would need somebody who works at McDonald's, you would exactly. need somebody who works in the red light district in Los Angeles, you, and they probably are too busy. You, you know, you say, come and do this test for the next hour. Well, hey, I've got work to do somewhere else, and it, it's difficult to, and, and you would need perhaps somebody with dementia, and how would they understand what the thing's all about? And, and you would need a child of age two. And so it goes on. Yeah. Uh, and unless you had all of that, and even if you had all of that, there would still be people that say, no, we don't have an average interrogator, therefore, etc., etc. And, and I'm and sure so somebody would say, just like with Noam Chomsky and the bulldozer, they'll say, ah, it's a computer, it's not yeah, a big deal at all, pass the Turing test, so what? It doesn't so what? change anything. Which, is, which there's a lot of philosophy about. Um, you know, a lot of John Searle's arguments. Yeah. Yes, it might yeah. pass the Turing the test, but fun. it doesn't understand what it's doing, and yeah. then you're into that. So, Just like it was, ju it was said yesterday about Watson, that, you know, yes, he won in jeopardy, but he doesn't even get what, what you know, no. it's pure, oh, yeah. what they call uh, uh, brute computation, that yeah. he uh, figures out the questions. Well, I feel, my own feeling is, the people that make such comments are the ones that are not particularly intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll leave it. I'll leave yeah, it that, at that. That will, that will annoy <laughs> I'll leave 80 it at percent that. of computer scientists. I'll leave it at that, and I'll move on to uh, the, the, the closing questions here of our interview. Um, and I'll put it, I'll turn the table a little bit on you and ask you about this very interesting observation, both about you and some other very smart and brilliant pioneering people. So let me preface it by this. Um, the writer, the, the science fiction writer, the author of um, Neuromancer, William Gibson, uh, uh, shocked uh, his fans when he shared with them that he uh, wrote the book on a very old-fashioned typewriter. I am interviewing Werner Vinge next month, uh, the, the person who coined the term the technological singularity, yeah. and according to his own admission, he's very low-tech at home, and we're doing the interview <laughs> over landline phone in, yes. in his home. Yes. Now, let's bring this to you, and I watched a video interview with you a few months ago. You've done your homework, yes, I can see where this question's <laughs> coming. Yeah. In which your wife, Irena... Okay, we'll finish it there, that's it. <laughs> yeah, go on. Yeah. In which your wife, Irena, was sharing with us that you are very low-tech at your own home, and she was in the kitchen when that's being done, and... She said that she didn't even have a dishwasher, and it was very low tech. And even though I, I she am, wanted, I am the dishwasher. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and even though she wanted to get a computer, you didn't like to get a computer at home. <laughs> so, yeah. so my question to you is is twofold. First, did you get a dishwasher and a computer at home? And two, why or why not? Right. Um, I, I cannot disagree with anything my wife said. Irena, she's a wonderful, wonderful woman, puts up with a lot. I mean, it's quite right. Um, I'm exactly how you've described it. In the university, which is where I am now, the wonderful University of Reading, number one in the world, I am very much technologically integrated on Skype and uh, all implants and everything. Doors open for me when I just walk nearby and so on. At home, it's completely the opposite. She's quite right. We don't have a dishwasher. Partly it's her fault. She's very mean with money, um, <laughs> uh, which there's nothing wrong with that. But we don't have a microwave oven. We, we do have a burglar alarm, I have to say, in case there's anybody there <laughs> thinking. Uh, it's a very powerful one immediately. What are they going to come the... for if you don't have a condition? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> not even the microwave. Absolutely nothing. No, they, they could pinch the door and that's about it. Um, yeah, there is nothing. There. So we are very, very, but I have to say, a good friend of mine, Charles Shinorigan, he gave me a, a laptop.
laptop which we now have at home. So we, we are connected, we're on Wi-Fi, uh, largely through my wife's insistence. And uh, I have to say it means that now I don't get so much downtime because at home people know I can, and so they're sending emails all hours of the day and things like that. And, uh, and of course, you have to answer emails within a few seconds of them arriving. So um, I never never rest. I don't sleep anymore since uh, having the computer. But we are gen even with the computer, we're still fairly um, low low tech at home, and long may it be so. Yeah. How, how do you explain this paradox, though? I mean, like, isn't that strange that all those people, you, Werner Vinge, uh, William Gibson, and, and a number of others, have such a paradoxical disconnect between their professional work and their personal life? Well, I don't know that I have a professional work and personal life. My my life is is just all one one thing, as it were. So it's really sort of time sharing. I mean, I I don't really, to be honest, don't don't tell the university. But I mean, I I absolutely love doing what I do, and if they pay me for it, hey, I'm I'm not going to stop them, you know. Um, so I, I see it as my person, personal life, and somebody's paying me to have fun and enjoy. So great. So don't, please don't broadcast that. Uh, I I just see it as a personal life, and but I I'm, I mean, I've always felt that with implants, like the implant that I had last, I it's a bit like um, Keanu Reeves in The Matrix. You you he could sort of plug in and plug out. And um, in this case, I plugged in and well, you know had my nervous system connected on the internet and all sorts of stuff, um, which which w was great fun. It was quite scary, uh, but it's also uh, you you are real really connected, and therefore to be really unconnected at times to unplug myself and unwind and not be linked up also is important. I for me anyway. So it, it's um. It's sort of an all or nothing, uh, either really connected heavily, and I've been able to chop it up in terms of when I'm in this building that I'm in now, in the university, I'm connected, very much part of it, and then when I'm in the other building, in my house, it's separate, I'm, I'm not connected, and so in a way it's easier perhaps in my mind to, uh, now it's a bit confusing, because we, we're on Wi-Fi and uh, we've got a computer and it's, it's sort of uh, infringing on my downtime, so uh, <laughs> I need down downtime now, but I, uh, rather than up up time. Speaking of plugging in, um, I think we're coming to the last uh, two questions of the interview here, but uh, speaking of plugging in, let me ask you this sort of a hypothetical deep plug-in question. Um, in the Star Trek series, uh, Captain Jean-Luc Picard and a, a number of other people were uh, sort of hijacked by the Borg and assimilated by force into the collective. Uh, and then eventually, of course, they escaped and so on and so on. But my question to you is this. If you were to be hijacked by the Borg, and uh, implant it with a new co cortex uh, implant and sort of plugged into the collective. Would you resist that or wouldn't you? And why and why not? Uh, I mean, I don't know that I'm against the Borg. I, I think there's a lot of positives with regard to the Borg, particularly if you're part of the Borg, you can understand and see those positives more. And I think what we do see anyway in society is with something like cell phones. If you went back 20 or 30 years, you'd probably find a lot of people that say, no, I don't want a cell phone. It's not going to happen anyway. Practically, it's not going to work. But I certainly don't want this thing where I can be contacted all the time and I can have such a, an interaction. But society moves forward and people want it. People want credit cards which connect them in more. Again, years ago, I said, no, I want cash. I wouldn't have a bit of plastic. I just wouldn't accept it. But you change and you go for it. Big brother, we, we have to an extent because we want it, because we benefit from it. We, we gain things. So I think... If it was the Borg coming along and enforcing something, I, I, well, I, I think like everybody else, I would rail against it a little bit. But if the Borg was clever 
which I suspect they would be, or the, they, it would be in practice, um, I'm sure it wouldn't be seen as forcing. It, it would entice. It would give seduce all sorts of, it would seduce very much, tempt you in. So look, if you're a part of the Borg, then look at all these positives. You know, you there can are have all your extra sensory input that extra you're looking sensory for. input. You, you want to think about having sex with Bridget Bardo <laughs> or whoever it is. Sorry, Bridget, if you're listening. Uh, fine, you can do that. You can do whatever you want and it, your life will be wonderful no more negatives um yeah why not so i think the borg will be a little cleverer and the the stupid one would be captain kirk for trying to get out of the borg you know who wouldn't want that sort of existence so i, I see it as a very positive thing the borg would be a bit cleverer and of course i would love to be part of it yeah no question about that <laughs> I thought maybe so. i would still want a little bit of downtime i mean that's the, whether it's all or nothing it's a, that's a tough cookie i mean whether you, if you could have sort of 90 uh -huh. percent borg and then 10 percent you just go and chill out that, but that's that the whole problem problem is <laughs> once you're plugged in there's no unplugging <laughs> Oh, yeah, 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 but it doesn't mean, I mean, it's like having a credit card, you, you, you use it when you want to. It's like having a cell phone, and if you can still use it when you want to, but there's, there's pressures on being connected all the time, or the same with, um, you know, in email and things like that. So it depends how much, even if you're part of the Borg, you know, do you have the ability to, pull back a little bit or not be so connected. I mean, uh, technical questions. Uh, Captain Kirk should have, uh, should have asked those. <laughs> <laughs> it probably would have made it awkward for the program, though, to... Uh... All right, very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, let's close our interview with uh, your message um, that you would like to send out to all of our listeners. Last time your message was you have to take risks to be part of the future. Would you like to enhance or supplement that message in any way today, or would you like to send out a second one? Yeah, I mean, I would. Um, I, science is fun. Experimentation is fun. You, you can have a bit of a laugh with it as well and enjoy it. Um, it is serious at times, but it can be fun as well. And it, it would be nice, even if people are not naturally scientists, doesn't mean they can't join in and experiment and have a bit of fun. And so I, I would say, not just to, to Ray to, to get involved, but for other people, um, you know, join in if you want to. Uh, don't stand back and just philosophize about it, but um, become the Borg. <laughs> wow, that's that's fantastic. Okay, thank you. That's uh, you know I, I am the w one of those who are very interested and who are very much just philosophizing and who has never done any. Well, implants. there we go, Nicola, be the Borg. Yeah, and I, I admit I have a lot more resistance than you do, actually. So <laughs> it, it, it would take a lot more courage, and, and in my case, uh, the early adopters risk that we discussed in, in the previous interview is something yep. which really pushes me away. I want to make sure it works for you guys, and okay. then I'll consider the risks. Uh, you you almost went along with it. You almost said, "Okay, I, then I will." And but now you're very, very, very uh, politically. <laughs> I I will email you. Um, if I got if I've got your email, yes. uh, I will email you a few slides that fit with the, what the students are doing. Absolutely, so I would put all the links uh, and um, all the pictures up. Brilliant. So, um, thank you very much for your interview, Kevin. Cheers, Nicola. Good speaking with you. See you again in a, uh, a few months' time, and we, we should keep this going every six months or so for the next 600 years, so we make a date. Yeah. Absolutely, and then we can reconsider our relationship. Yeah, and if, if, we, don't, <laughs> if, we, don't, <laughs> if we don't make it for that long, we will complain to Aubrey and say, hey, you were wrong, guy, you got it wrong. Absolutely. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you, Kevin.